Λοιπόν, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, κυρίε και κύριοι, καλώ ήρθατε στο Καλαδικό Ινστιτούτο στην Ελλάδα. Είμαι ο Ζακ Περό, διευθυντή του, του Ινστιτούτου. Είναι μεγάλη τιμή για τον Τζόναθαν Τόμλινσον, ο υπόδιευθυντή του Ινστιτούτου, για την κυρία Ζωή Δηλιβάση, η υπόδιευθυντή. Uh, συγγνώμη, υπεύθυνη για uh, πολιτιστικέ uh, δραστηριότητε και βεβαίω για μένα να σα έχουμε μαζί μα απόψε uh, στο πρώτο uh, webinar του uh, Ινστιτούτου. Uh, είπα απόψε γιατί <laughs> στην Ελλάδα είναι 7 και 7 το βράδυ, uh, όμω uh, είναι 12 το μεσημέρι στο Μόντρεαλ που είμαι εγώ, 12 το μεσημέρι και στον Οντέριο, εκεί που είναι ο, ο μιλητής μας, ο καθηγητής Τρίστεν Κάρτερ, και είναι 9 το πρωί στο Βανκούβερ, που έχουμε μέλη του Ινστιτούτου, που είναι και αυτοί μαζί μας για αυτήν την διάρρεξη. Αλλά έτσι είναι τα πράγματα σήμερα και είναι... Πολύ καλό. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers amis, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à l'Institut canadien de, en Grèce. Je m'appelle Jacques Perrault, je suis directeur de l'Institut et c'est un grand plaisir pour moi, pour, pour l'assistant directeur Jonathan Tomlinson et pour notre responsable des activités euh, culturelles, euh, Madame Zoé Delivasis, de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à ce premier, ce premier webinaire euh, qui, comme je viens de le dire, se tient à, à 7 heures euh, en soirée en Grèce, mais il est, il est midi à Montréal où je me trouve et il est midi en Ontario et 9 heures du matin à Vancouver où nous avons euh, aussi euh, des, euh, des collègues euh, qui, euh, qui sont avec nous pour cette, pour cette conférence. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear friend, Jacques Perrault. I'm Jacques Perrault, the director of the Canadian Institute in Greece, and I'm very um, happy to have you all uh, with us uh, tonight. Um, I'm happy. My, uh, my the, the assistant director, Jonathan Tomlinson, is, is um, happy. And of course, um, our cultural uh, program manager, uh, Zoe Delibasis, also. We're all very happy to, to have you with us. Uh, for this, um, this uh, first Canadian Institute um, webinar. Um, our lecturer tonight, Professor Tristan Carter, is uh, currently associate uh, professor uh, in the Department of Anthropology at McMaster University in, uh, in Ontario, uh, but for a few months uh, uh, only because he has just been appointed full professor at that same university and we will start starting uh, in this new position after July um, 1st of, of, um, of uh, this year. Um, Tristan Carter holds a BA and a PhD from uh, England, uh, University of Nottingham and the Institute of um, Archaeology at um, the University College in London. Uh, his uh, PhD thesis was on social significance of obsidian use in early Bronze Age Southern Aegean. Um, he held fellowships at the British School in Athens and the uh, British School in Ankara, uh, taught for six years at Stanford uh, University and started working at McMaster uh, in 2007. Tristan is a, a Eurasian prehistorian who, who engages in various debates from the earliest humans via the spread of farming to uh, later Bronze Age societies of the Eastern Mediterranean. Of course, he has um, quantities of um, publications uh, related to these, uh, these topics and which range from um, hunter, fisher, gatherer, river transportation in the upper Tigris uh, um, Valley in eastern Turkey to fingerprinting of quartzitic outcrops at Odulpai Gorge in Tanzania, and luckily for us, to the earliest occupation of the Central 
Aegean. Uh, Tristan's lecture today is entitled The Colonization of the Aegean Island uh, and the Global Origins of Seafaring, New Data from Naxos and Crete. And this uh, lecture is, of course, uh, partly based on the fieldwork he has been doing with the Canadian Institute since 2013 on the site of Stilida on the Cycladic island of Naxos. So I'm now going to um, pass on the microphone to uh, my colleague, Tristan Carter. Um, I would uh, once again uh, ask you to um, close your uh, microphones and, um, uh, and the cameras. And if you have uh, questions, um, uh, for the end of the lecture, please um, write them in the uh, chat window that you, 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 you will open up on the right side of your, 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 your window your com on, on your computer. And so that Tristan sees them and will be able to answer them because there's you're way too many uh, on, the, uh, on the screen. I unfortunately I can't see you all. So uh, Tristan, uh, it's now up to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Perot. Um, just to confirm you can hear me, yes? Uh, okay, um, Calispera, bonsoir, good evening. Um, thank you for all coming out in this new, wonderfully uh, uh, connected world of ours, uh, one of the few upsides of the, uh, the era of pandemic. Um, I hope I've pitched this at the right level. I, I, I've pitched this as best I can to a general audience, so I'm quite happy to take some more sort of specialized questions uh, towards the end if, if they come up. Um, what I'm going to try and do in this uh, talk is sketch out a timeline, uh, not just chronologically, we're going to be looking at the earliest data first and going to the more recent, but also a chronology of scholarship. So I'm gonna start out with what we once believed, um, a very important paper published in the 1980s as to what we thought was happening in the Aegean Islands, uh, and then how these uh, received ideas were impacted by discoveries made just over a decade ago uh, in Gavdos and, and Crete, uh, and then more recent discoveries in Naxos, and, and what the current state of play is with regard to our understanding of the colonization uh, of the Aegean Islands and how this plays into a much larger set of debates in sort of anthropological archaeology. Um, now, part of, of today's lecture is going to be drawing upon the work uh, that my colleagues and I have been doing since 2013 on the island of Naxos, which, as Professor Perot mentioned, uh, has been under the, uh, 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 the guidance support uh, of the Canadian Institute in Greece. However, even though I'm speaking here today uh, solo, uh, we need to appreciate that this is very much a collaborative uh, piece of work and that I'm drawing upon the skills and the knowledge uh, and the research of a number of other scholars. First and foremost, uh, while this is a Canadian Institute project, since 2015, we've also been an official collaboration with the Cycladic Effort of Antiquities, the Synecasia, uh, and my co-director, uh, Dr. Dimitris Afanasoulis, who is the head of uh, Cycladic Archaeology. And like I said, uh, one of the wonderful things about running a project like this is that I get to create uh, research space for lots of junior scholars while also uh, interacting with a number of other internationally established scholars such as uh, Takis uh, Karkanas and, and Nikos Skarpelis, a recent PhD student, Justin Holcomb, and, and then a, a gaggle of young uh, Greek, Canadian, Serbian, French, British, German, uh, undergraduates and graduates. So thanks to all of them for all their hard work and their intellectual input. And again, I'm representing all of us today. Okay, so our story begins over 2 million years ago, which is an approximate date we shall give for the evidence for the first dispersal of our human ancestors out of Africa. As we currently understand it, the origins of humanity, depending on various definitions, goes back to about 3.3 million years ago in Africa. And then sometime around 2 million years, if not a bit earlier, based on some new exciting dates from India and China, we have a dispersal probably of Homo erectus out of Africa and eventually for the population, the population of uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, they move, we think, uh, 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 across 
the Sahara Desert, up the Levant. And then for us, the most pertinent thing is hanging a left through Anatolia and into the area we refer to today as Europe. Now, the received wisdom in this hypothesis is that once one gets to the Aegean, which of course is our area of interest, is the Aegean is fairly irrelevant to this narrative. Um, here you have a, a, a classic map published um, a, a, about 10 years ago that sketches out an, a hypothetical uh, route of the dispersal of Homo erectus out of uh, uh, Africa, through Asia and into Europe. And the Aegean is essentially bypassed. The logic for that is because the Aegean as a body of water represents a barrier to these characters. They were incapable of crossing water. They were coerced by extent to follow a terrestrial pedestrian route uh, whereby the only way they could travel is across the land bridge of Thrace. So across what today would be Northwest um, uh, Turkey, Bulgaria, and into Northern Greece, and then further westwards. One of the points about all of this, or a key point of departure here, is that seafaring, i.e. the ability to make a, a, a seagoing craft uh, and to propel it across water from a, a continental landmass uh, um, to an island, other uh, continental landmass, is something we have long associated exclusively with us, us being Homo sapiens. So seafaring for many, many scholars until recently has been one of the indices of behavioral modernity. So very rapidly, this entire uh, debate about uh, access to the islands in the Aegean, and in fact globally, becomes part of what one could term uh, rather glibly the archaeology of ego. What is it that makes us special, us being homo sapiens? Now, many of us would have been brought up with the very familiar image in the bottom left here, the idea that we as homo sapiens are the end game of a nice unilinear evolutionary scheme whereby we've left behind all of our less advanced um, ancestors. We now know that's complete, completely wrong. And in fact, today we appreciate uh, that human evolution is much more complex, uh, much more dendritic, much more tree-like. Uh, and the most important thing to take away from the image, you, the, the, the main picture you see here is that throughout prehistory, um, there has always been more than one uh, species at any one time. There have been a number of different Homo species or Australopithecines before them contemporaneously. And so we're in a really weird moment in, in global history in that we are the only characters in town. A as of about 30,000 years ago, it's only Homo sapiens. A and yet for a long time, there was us and a whole bunch of other characters living, at this, uh, uh, living in the world. So we now have come to appreciate, and, and this is changing very rapidly, that up until about 30,000 years ago, it wasn't just Homo sapiens, but there was most famously the Neanderthals, uh, there was the Denisovans, Homo floresiensis in Southeast Asia, Homo malayli. Um, did everybody make sure you please turn off your um, microphones? Microphones off, oh, thank you. Um, okay, so one of the issues we're facing here, um, Professor Perrault, uh, if you have control over mute, could you please press that button now? Thank you. Um, okay, so one of the, of the Okay, back. Okay, so one of the big questions then is what is it that makes us special? Why did Homo sapiens outlive everybody else? What were the, oops. Ah, sausages. Ah, okay. What were the winning evolutionary traits that we had? Okay, so up until relatively recently, there were a number of things that were put forward uh, that were meant to be indicative of how special we were. Some of the winning evolutionary traits. So for example, in theory, only modern humans, only Homo sapiens were capable of seafaring, which is a reflection of greater technological and cognitive capability. 
uh, we were the only people in theory who had language, who produced uh, symbolic behavior such as burying the dead, perhaps beliefs in afterlife, um, uh, the production of art, all of which reflected uh, a series of greater intellectual, uh, uh, cognitive and technological capabilities that ultimately we believe resulted in us surviving the various trials and tribulations of the Ice Age, whereby we survived and everybody else died out. This can be sort of relatively neatly encapsulated in this simple image. In terms of like, you know, what are the winning strategies? Us, homo sapiens, you know, seafaring language, art, burial, etc. That was all according to the archeological record or interpretation of it associated with us homo sapiens and not associated with Neanderthals, Denisovans or earlier characters. However, things have changed pretty radically in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So whereas once upon a time, for example, the Neanderthals would be seen as the quintessential uh, knuckle dragging uh, brute the, the, you know, the dim-witted cave dweller, representations of which we see in scientific literature, such as these images here, um, the Neanderthal has undergone a massive rebranding thanks to our new discoveries and our reinterpretation of existing data. We now appreciate through genetics the Neanderthals were indeed capable of speech. We have fairly good evidence for a number of cases where the Neanderthals buried their dead, showing that that's not exclusively associated with Homo sapiens. We even have some indirect evidence uh, in Spain for the production of art over 65,000 years ago, when in theory, the only people around were Neanderthals, suggesting that, you know, the Neanderthals were also capable of abstract thought and behavior. We also have evidence of them making adornments. Uh, again, you know, these are symbolic behaviors, uh, uh, technologically complex activities, things that previously we only associated with Homo sapiens. And now we can turn our attention to seafaring that once again was exclusively associated with Homo sapiens, but now is a bit more up for grabs. And the two biggest case studies until recently, uh, which have led us to uh, uh, reappraise this relationship between seafaring and behavioral modernity comes from Southeast Asia and the island of Flores, and more pertinent for us, the island of Crete. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of all of this, one of the key things to point out about this map is how problematic this is. Specifically, this is a modern map. It's all very uh, um, recognizable to you and I because this is indeed what the Mediterranean, what the Aegean looks like today. But that's not how things look like in the period we're talking about. So most of this lecture is going to be focusing on the Pleistocene. Um, we today are in the, uh, the either in the Anthropocene or the Holocene. The Holocene started about uh, 11,600 years ago, which is marked by the end of the Ice Age. So the period we're talking about is Ice Age archaeology. Now, the temperature fluctuated within the Ice Age in uh, where we have some slightly warmer interglacial periods, but most importantly are the glacial periods, the very cold periods. And during those very cold periods, we have huge amounts of water from the globe's oceans being sucked up into landmass glaciers. Now, those very cold periods basically then mean that the sea levels go far, far down. So, we know, for example, that in the coldest points of the Pleistocene, the coldest points of the Ice Age, the Mediterranean was 150 meters lower than it is today. This is what the Mediterranean would look like under such conditions. Basically, huge amounts of land are gained. What is today water would have been land. Islands that today float, you know, float as an insular uh, uh, you know, um, you know, a separation would have been part of land masses. So when we start talking about the origins of seafaring uh, in the Aegean, one of the things we have to be very clear about is, you know, are we actually talking about areas that would have been part of a sea or would they have been joined uh, to continental Greece or Anatolia? Um, and there's been some fabulous work by uh, uh, Greek paleogeographers over the last few years. This is a paper that was published uh, in 2009 by uh, Lycusis, and, and this is an estimation of what the Aegean would have looked like in four different periods during the Pleistocene. And we can see if you look, if you focus on the bottom two maps, these are maps represented of the cold periods 
around 300 to 250,000 years ago on the bottom left, and 480 to 350,000 years ago uh, on the bottom right. You can see during those very cold points, you could actually have walked from Anatolia to continental Greece. And most of the islands we talk about today, the Cyclades, the Dodecanes, etc., weren't even islands. Key points that we should return to in due course. Okay, so the received wisdom. Until relatively recently, the idea was that nobody was occupying the islands of the Aegean, or in fact the islands anywhere in the Mediterranean, until very, very recently by human standards. This idea was first put out by uh, the then Cambridge prehistorian, John Cherry, he's now based at Brown in the US, in an incredibly important, a, a very uh, uh, thoughtful paper called Patman Process of the Earliest Colonization of the Mediterranean Islands, published in 1981. This was a tour de force piece of work by a scholar who was really following the kind of the guidelines of the new archeology, span trying to take uh, a big picture approach to anthropological archeology, span and rather than fixating on local specificities, looking for larger scale patterns in, in terms of what humans did at certain times in certain places under certain conditions. So whereas up until this point, we would have had a whole bunch of really good scholars working in Cyprus, talking about Cyprus, or Crete, talking about Crete, or Sicily, or Malta, or Sardinia, you know, talking amongst themselves, he took a more sort of, you know, or a, a pan-Mediterranean perspective and looked at the history of island colonization to see if there was any kind of patterning uh, to the origins of the first island occupants of the Med Mediterranean. And indeed, there seemed to be a very strong pattern. First and foremost, we come to appreciate that we have human, you know, uh, uh, human occupants of Europe, uh, the, uh, Asia on the, uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, North Africa for over a million years, putting us way back into the lower Paleolithic. These are pre-Homo sapiens populations. So we have a whole bunch of people living in, in Turkey, in what, what one today would refer to as Turkey, uh, and uh, Bulgaria, and Italy, and Spain, and North Africa, and Jordan, and Israel, and Palestine, over a million years ago. And yet, nobody managed to get their act together to build a boat and go into the islands until about 9,000 years ago. That's a hell of a discrepancy. All right. One of the other things that John Cherry noticed is that there is a pattern in that the islands that were first occupied were the biggest ones. So Cyprus, Crete, Cor Sardinia, Corsica and Sardinia were joined at the time, were the first islands to be occupied. Sicily at this time we think was largely still connected to mainland Italy. And then over time, the smaller island scapes are fleshed out. So 2000 years after we have the first occupation of Crete, we have the occupation uh, of the uh, Cyclades. Uh, and a bit later time, uh, we have places like the Balearic Islands uh, occupied. So there's a real pattern to all of this. So in our immediate context, big island, Crete is occupied first 9,000 years ago. Um, the larger Cyclades, places like Paros and Naxos, are occupied around 7,000 years ago. And then places like the Mitres uh, Kiklaves, the Kufenicia, Kufenisi, uh, Keros, etc., are not occupied until about 5,000 years ago in the early Bronze Age. Importantly, if we step back, this hypothesis that John Cherry gives us actually plays out globally. This is a universal model. But basically when one looks at the history of island occupation, wherever you are in the world, it's really, really late. And in short, what we can talk about is that it's only when we have Homo sapiens spreading across the globe that we truly get a global archeology. span And that until we have Homo sapiens, open waters and by extent island colonization is an impossibility. We don't have people living in deserts. We don't have people living up top of mountains and we don't have people reaching the polar regions. Though all of these in theory are exclusive to Homo sapiens and yet again, a reflection of our greater capabilities, our abilities to adapt to different environments, our abilities to build uh, the craft to, to meet islands or the clothing to uh, survive in such cold climates, all of which can be seen as ultimate ultimately a reflection of our winning strategies and why we're around today and Neanderthals and all the others died out. 
So if we follow that model, um, you know, over a million years ago, we have the spread, uh, you know, probably closer to two million years ago, we have Homo erectus uh, moving out of Africa and then eventually moving westwards through Anatolia uh, into uh, uh, Central and Western Europe. Within that scheme, however, um, Greece does still seem to have been largely bypassed. If you look at the dates of the earliest Paleolithic activity in the area we today re would refer to as Greece, it's, it's pretty late. So, you know, Western Anatolia, we have dates over a million years. Uh, Bulgaria, we have dates from over a million years. And yet the, you know, the, old, you know, the oldest state is only 500,000 years ago from the recently published site of Marathusa I uh, in the central Peloponnese. So it might seem to suggest that, you know, indeed the Aegean is a barrier and, and something of a cul-de-sac. You know, you might go back down into Greece, uh, you know, once you've sort of gone across Thrace uh, and into sort of Western Europe. So we seem to be quite late. For the Middle Paleolithic, um, which is the period, we'll say, around um, two, in the Aegean, is probably around 250 to around 40,000 years ago, uh, and is a period we primarily associate with the Neanderthals, we have lots of really good evidence for Neanderthal activity uh, in Greece. Lots of stuff from Thessaly, uh, the, the Mani, Epirus, lots and lots of sites. So in, in fact, uh, Greece seems to have been very popular with Neanderthal populations. And also crucially, because this stuff is fairly rare, we do actually have remains of Neanderthals from a couple of cave sites in the Marni, from the Kalamakis and the Laconis caves. Uh, the rest of the sites we believe to be Neanderthal based on their distinctive stone tools, which I shall come back to in a minute. Stage three, the finally we have the arrival of Homo sapiens, which according to the old model occurred somewhere around you know, 41,000 years ago um, when we're talking about the Aegean. This is a map that was produced by the Cambridge prehistorian Paul Mellars back in 1996. And he sees uh, for Homo sapiens, even though they are capable of uh, making boats, he sees the path of least resistance once again as being to move across the Thracian land bridge, moving out of Africa, through the Levant, through Anatolia and into um, Western Europe. And we have a couple of relatively early sites uh, in this sequence uh, down in the Argolid at the Frankfurt Clizora Caves. Uh, sites I shall refer to in due course. So finally, after around 40,000 years ago, Homo sapiens is in the hood. But we still have to wait quite a long time before we see anything in the islands. So it's not until stage four, the, the, the latter part of the Paleolithic. So from around 15,000 years ago, maybe, probably more like 13,000 years ago, um, we have the first evidence, indirect evidence for the exploration of the Aegean islands. And we see this because we find tiny amounts of obsidian, the volcanic glass that exclusively uh, we associate with the island of Milos, well, a couple of other islands, but we have chemically proven that there is a small amount of uh, obsidian from Milos that turns up on the Greek mainland at the site of the Frankthi cave and also the Shistoki cave just outside Athens uh, in Attica. And that material is dated back to around 13 to 15,000 years ago, showing that late Homo sapiens hunter-gatherers are starting to make boats and move into the islands, use some of the local raw materials, but they're not in theory living in the islands. This isn't a period of true colonization. So in that model, everything is pretty late. We don't actually have uh, a true colonization of the islands until we become farmers. And so the earliest occupation of Crete, we believe, is with the advent of farming, the Neolithic. And, and one of the pieces of logic about this is in the Neolithic, we invent these, these new tools, including nice new stone axes, which enables us to cut down trees, make boats, etc. So the true occupation of the Greek islands is a really, really late affair, considering how long people have been living in the surrounding region. Well, that was the received wisdom. That was the idea until a few years ago. When in 2008 to 2010, we have some very important and some very controversial data that suggests we may have to completely rewrite this model. Okay, so in the old model, 
the understanding was that nobody got their act together to move into the islands of not just the Aegean, but the Mediterranean more generally, so Cyprus, Core Sardinia, Crete, etc., until the advent of farming. So this isn't just, you know, Homo sapiens arrives, we go into the islands. Homo sapiens arrives, the hunter-gatherers, for about 30,000 years, and then eventually they move into the islands. And so up until 2009, 2010, the idea was that nobody was living on Knossos until about 9,000 years ago when we have uh, the colonization of the island by migrating farmers who establish a farming way of life in what was essentially virgin territory. Nobody was living there. These farmers variously may have come from either central Anatolia, Cyprus, or the northern Levant. However, that thesis has now been challenged. In 2008, we had a paper published by uh, Professor Katarina Kopika from the University of Rethymno, claiming to have discovered, uh, with a survey on Gavdos, evidence for middle Paleolithic stone tools. Stone tools that in theory were at least 40,000 years ago old, and in theory should have been associated with Neanderthals. 2009, we then have a paper claiming much the same thing from a surface survey uh, in uh, Lutro in Western Crete. And then perhaps most impactful of all, we have the publication of uh, a survey, the Plakias survey in 2010, uh, undertaken by Tom Strasser, Curtis Runnels and Eleni Panagopoulou, uh, a synagogue between the American School and the Ephoria of Paleoanthropology, claiming radically, controversially, that there was evidence for lower Paleolithic and middle Paleolithic activity in Crete. The basis of their evidence was a number of what they claimed to be uh, highly distinctive stone tools that they found on the surface of a number of sites in the, uh, in the Plakias area of, south, uh, of west uh, southern Crete. Their claims were bold. They argued that based on the shape and the technology of these tools, that they, they could only be lower Paleolithic, at least 250,000 years by our current understandings. Not only were they of that age, they proclaimed that they had more in common with the stone tools of Africa at this time, rather than the sort of tools you found on mainland Greece or in mainland Anatolia at this time, leading to their conclusion that Crete had been colonized by pre-Homo sapiens populations directly from Africa. Now, this caused a huge splash, was picked up by the press, um, was celebrated by the New York Times, by National Geographic, lots of ink was spilled in the popular press about this claim. This was a huge rewriting. Up until this point, we thought that nobody was on Crete until 9,000 years ago, and then this project claims we have people there who in theory could have been there over a quarter of a million years ago, and they weren't even Homo sapiens. And, and you know, in theory, only Homo sapiens makes boats. So this then becomes not only a huge story in terms of uh, the history of Cretan archeology, span but this directly impacts our understandings of Homo sapiens and, and their specialness, uh, and by extent, all of those things that our ancestors in theory can't do. A year later, they published arguably a more important paper, which actually produced some scientific dates. Um, now, this wasn't an excavation. This is material uh, that was found on the surface or eroding out of geological uh, strata that they dated using a well-established technique to show that this material was at least 113,000 years old. Now, again, the significance about all of this is twofold at this time. One. In theory, Homo sapiens isn't in the Aegean until about 40,000 years ago, so it has to be pre-Homo uh, sapiens. And B, even allowing for all of that sea level fluctuation during the Pleistocene, Crete was always an island. Ergo, for people to be there 113,000 years ago, they had to make a boat to get there. And in theory, it had to be pre-sapiens populations. Big deal. Okay. Like I said, this was a hugely impactful piece uh, and a hugely controversial piece. Um, and a lot of academic ink has also been spilt on critically reflecting upon uh, the, 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 the data quality and the significance of the Cretan discoveries. 
Um, most of these papers are quite fair, they, they can be quite critical, um, but, but they sort of engage uh, with the, uh, you know, in, in the form of, of scholarly discipline, polite, pushing back, question, etc. One of the things I, I find slightly problematic is that there's a lot of bad mouthing of this project by people who have not spilled ink on it. They just sort of, you know, bitch about it behind everybody's back. So I want to just spend a little bit of time thinking about what the potential problems are with the Cretan data. One of the problems, allegedly, is the material is not archaeology. It's a bunch of natural rocks that look like old tools. Now, I have a certain sympathy with this argument. I, I should be quite clear in that I do not believe this argument, but I have a sympathy with it. Why do I have a sympathy with it? Well, the stone tools made in the Plakias region are made from a raw material we call quartz, um, uh, which is a god-awful raw material. Most people who work with stone tools, including my good, good self uh, in the Aegean, have the benefit of working with obsidian, which is a beautiful raw material. It's very easy to see what's, work, or what's happening with it. Similarly, if you work with radiolarite, jasper, chert, etc., it's quite easy to see what's happening. Quartz and quartzites are much rougher, much more uh, scrappy raw materials, whereby they don't flake quite so cleanly, etc., whereby it can be quite difficult to recognize what's going on. Uh, in 2009, when they discovered this material, I was lucky enough to visit the Apotheki and I was shown one of their superstar pieces. I remember holding it and, and getting quite carried away in terms of what well, this is. This is amazing. This is, you know, this is super sexy, very important. And then I had to stop myself and say, OK, it's the right shape. It's the right size. But can I actually see that it's been culturally worked? It's definitely an artifact. And I stared at it good and hard and I maybe saw a third of what they had uh, depicted in their technical drawings. Now, again, to be fair, I haven't worked with this material very much. Curtis Runnels, the main stone tool specialist, had a great deal of experience with it. But nonetheless, it is a difficult material to work with archeologically. Uh, the article I reference here from 2014, there was a slightly embarrassing blind test undertaken at the Institute of Archeology span uh, about 10 years ago by Ignacio de la Torre, who works at the Old Divide Gorge, who made, a bunch of replica tools in quartz, and then mix them up with a whole bunch of natural pieces of quartz, and then show them to a bunch of Paleolithic experts to say, pick out the cultural ones and the natural ones. It was a car crash, it was a complete disaster. This stuff is difficult to see. So I have a sympathy with those people who think it's natural, except most people I know who think it's natural haven't actually seen the material firsthand. One of the other critiques that gets leveled at it is that this material isn't from an excavation. You know, it's eroded, it's in secondary context, etc. Now, ideally, yes, it would be from an excavation, but you know what? We're dealing with material of a very old date, which means that it's undergone a whole bunch of uh, uh, modifications, earthquakes, erosion, etc., whereby very rarely this stuff is in primary context. And that's true of lower Paleolithic archaeology globally, right? but we have excellent dates. This material is from a geological stratum uh, that was deposited at least 113,000 years ago. The artifacts themselves might be significantly older. They could be 500,000 years old. Who knows, they could be a million years old, but they are at least 113. Okay. Um, and then probably the, uh, the critique I, I have the greatest sympathy for is that a lot of uh, Paleolithic scholars thought that the team full, pulled a bit of a fast one. Um, the, article when it, uh, the article that caused all, all the, uh, the big press uh, coverage was published in the journal Hesperia, which is the journal of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. Most Paleolithic archeology span is published in places like the Journal of Paleolithic Archeology, span surprise, surprise, or the Journal of hum Human Evolution. And a lot of Paleolithic archeologists were very annoyed by the fact that they published in a, what they saw to be a completely irrelevant journal. You pulled a fast one, you, you're bypassing the scholarly community. Now, basically what happened was the, the project was run uh, through the American school and felt published in the in-house journal. They were doing the right thing according to their sponsors. I understand that. I, I think in hindsight, they made the wrong decision by doing that. I also am damn sure that the reviewers for this paper were specialists in the Paleolithic. So, okay, maybe optically they shot themselves in the foot. Does it negate the fact that we have material of cultural character in Crete over 113,000 years ago? As far as I'm concerned, no, it doesn't. 
All right, so the Cretan data, the material from Gavdos, slowly but surely becomes part of a larger uh, data set of proclaimed pre-Upper Paleolithic, and by extent in theory, pre-Homo sapiens activities on Aegean islands. Material published from uh, Milos by a geologist uh, in 1991 looks to all intents and purposes, you know, gorgeous uh, African type, lower Paleolithic, Alduin chopper tools and Achillean hand axes. There was also proclaimed Middle Paleolithic and in theory, Neanderthal material from Zakynthos and Catalonia. The trouble was, it was all alleged. It was all surface material without scientific dates. Preveli was the only place that had scientific dates from a place that we knew was categorically an island. And then we had the work of Professor Nena Galanidou uh, up in uh, Lesvos at the site of uh, Rodolf Nidia, where we have dates of over 400,000 years old. But Lesvos is almost certainly part of uh, uh, the continent at this time. Uh, at no point do we think it's an island until much more recently. So it doesn't really contribute to this, were there pre-sapiens populations on islands argument. So this is kind of a scenario in 2013, when we decided to start our project at Stoliva. Slowly but surely, we're at Stoliva. So Stoliva is today located on the northwest coast of the island of Naxos, which as many of you should know, is the largest island of the Cyclades, which are essentially a bunch of mountaintops sticking out of the Aegean Sea, and at lower times but would have been joined to one another, if not to the mainland itself, but that's getting slightly ahead of ourselves. The site uh, comprises a peninsula, a double peat, a very distinctive double peat uh, hill jutting out into the water about three kilometers uh, as the crow flies from the modern port town of Hora. The significance of the site, why, why, we, why we are there, and more importantly, why people were there uh, in prehistory, is that it is this uh, very neatly delimited outcrop of a geological product we refer to as chert, a silicious uh, raw material uh, that, if you know what you're doing with, uh, is a very good raw material for the making of stone tools. It's not as famous as the obsidian from Milos. Uh, it's not as sharp as the material from uh, Milos or, or as, as easy to use, but it's more robust. So it's really good for making, you know, chopping tools, axes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it outcrops in, in a very large amount here at Stoliva. We tend to mainly associate this raw material with northern Greece, with Epirus and uh, Macedonia and, and up on the Pindus, et cetera. So this is a very large amount of raw material by southern Aegean standards. Um, if we, I can just quickly show you a little bit of um, uh, a drone video. All of these white rocks outcropping are the natural uh, occurrences of chert. The area you're seeing now to the south of it is immediately into a very different geology, into a granite. Um, here's some of the excavations. Uh, these are from a few years ago. Um, blah, 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 just to give you a, a very brief impression and hopefully in a second, you'll be able to see the, the massive boulders and outcropping of this raw material. So uh, here you can see these great walls of, of the chert outcropping here. Okay, so we're not really talking about mining or quarrying. People were able to go there and just pick up raw material and start working it or breaking pieces off the, uh, the, uh, the natural um, rock surface. Now, we didn't discover Stoliva. Stalida was discovered by uh, a survey undertaken by René Troy on behalf of the École Française d'Athènes uh, back in the early 1980s. And in 1983, a short article was published by Michel Sefriades on their discoveries uh, at Stalida, which was part of a Naxos-wide um, uh, survey. The article was relatively brief. It, it, it talked a bit about the uh, geology. It talked about the site being littered uh, with stone tools and, and uh, produced a few uh, rather rudimentary drawings thereof. The one problem Seferiades had was in knowing what date it was. And so he rather tentatively suggested that the material was maybe Epipaleolithic, so the very end of the Paleolithic, or perhaps early Neolithic. Again, it's all surface material. There was, there was no excavation to date. Um, why was there this tentative argument? Well, on the one hand, 
you know, there had been prehistoric archaeology uh, encountered in the Cyclades, which uh, at this date went back as far as the late Neolithic. Um, and the very rich late Neolithic and richer early Bronze Age archaeology uh, of the, um, the Cyclades had produced lots and lots of stone tools, but nothing that looked like the Stelida material. In fact, on average, 98% of the stone tools from these Neolithic and Bronze Age sites were obsidian. So that suggested that maybe, you know, it, it wasn't Bronze Age or, or later Neolithic, so maybe it was a bit earlier. Um, but, it, but he only inched the argument back a little bit because two years previously, we had this very important, very influential and quite dynamically defended article by John Cherry, suggesting that in theory, nobody should be in the islands before the Neolithic. So you can understand why Sefriales was a little tentative about what he thought the date of Stelida was. Okay, so in 2013, um, thanks to support from uh, Olga Filaniotu um, uh, 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 of the uh, Greek Ministry of Culture and the Canadian Institute in Greece and uh, the Greek Ministry of Culture and the Scladic Ephria, we were able to start the Stelida Naxos Archaeological Project that in its initial iteration was uh, intended to be a survey to map uh, and characterize the geology and its associated archaeology across the hillside, with the aim, you know, at a grander scale, being to try to contribute to these new controversies about pre-Homo sapiens seafaring, and by extent, our understanding of the, uh, the cognitive and technological abilities of our ancestors, uh, and perhaps by extent, uh, offer a different vision of what we thought was going on with the Aegean Islands. We, in theory, were meant to do three years of survey. We only did two years of survey. So we diligently uh, laid out a whole bunch of transects and did the sort of nerdy things that archeologists do. We, we walked transects, we collected things in a, in a standardized way. We collected over 33,000 artifacts. I mean, this site is absolutely littered with artifacts. Um, you know, zero hyperbole to say there must be over a million artifacts on the surface alone, let alone once one starts excavating. Now, cut to the quick, we argued that we found a whole bunch of stone tools lying on the surface that looked Paleolithic. We argued we had Mesolithic, Upper, Middle, and Lower Paleolithic. The trouble is a lot of scholars, that evidence was just not good enough to start you know, putting forward these radical arguments that we're gonna, that we're gonna go against well, you know, long held understandings of Homo sapiens capabilities. What, you know, basically the argument ran like this. The only way you are gonna change our mind and change these, these patterns that aren't just about the, the, uh, the Aegean Islands, but how we understand global colonization full stop is by achieving an archeological gold standard. Basically what we needed to do was excavate and you needed to find intact stratigraphy. You needed to get good, good scientific dates um, and those dates should be dating artifacts that were indisputably made by humans. They weren't geofacts, they weren't natural. Um, and ideally, if you could find a skeleton of a Neanderthal or two, that would be really good. And all of these things have to be in stratigraphic association. So we decided to nix our final year of survey because it was completely pointless. We wouldn't have changed anybody's minds. Um, and we moved to excavation mode, now in the configuration of a synagogue with a Cycladic society. Cycladic Ephraim. Yeah. Now, when we, were, when we started this project, despite so much ink being spilled about this whole debate about island colonization, we were the only project dedicated to what there was a chance of being an island in the Mediterranean to actually be trying to ground truth these claims through excavation. All right. Um, Stelida is a wonderful site. It produces copious amounts of material, but it does come with a number of challenges. Firstly, it's, it's a hillside. Side. Um, it's quite a steep slope in certain places. And over the very long time of period we're talking about, it's undergone a whole bunch of ch uh, changes. Uh, the wind, the rain, gravity, earthquakes, etc., has shifted the archeology span all over the place, whereby most of what we excavate was unfortunately a whole bunch of stone tools that were made upslope that have now rolled down the slope. So most of our archaeology is in secondary context. We don't have beautiful napping floors of in-situ debris that we can date directly. Um, another challenge, you know, but you know, 
suck it up, this is why we're there, is there's a lot of material. Um, th this section from the top of the hill represents 75 uh, centimeters of almost pure lithics. When, when you dig this trench, you're digging out more lithics than dirt um, because, you know, uh, again, erosion has removed the soil and there's just stupid amounts of artifacts. In certain parts of the hill, because of the erosion, you're almost straight onto bedrock. The archaeology is very shallow. Five centimeters, you're done. But in other places, you get these natural uh, um, capturing, these natural outcrops of, of chert that serve as kind of natural terraces that then retain in place, albeit in secondary context, very deep archaeological horizons. We have one trench now that is almost five meters deep of pure archaeology. All right, so what have we found? Um, well, one of the other challenges, uh, uh, and this unfortunately is quite typical of the Aegean islands, is that often the, uh, the soil conditions be, can be either very acidic or in our case, very alkaline, which means that it really hinders the survival of any organics. So we don't find anything in, in terms of bones or plant materials, or very, very rarely, whereby, you know, understanding what kind of environment was it? You know, did people only come when it was warmer? or very cold, what were they eating, you know, et cetera. We have almost none of that information because it just doesn't preserve. Um, we have a couple of places where we have hearths, where we have old ancient fireplaces dating to the Paleolithic, where the burning has preserved, again, mainly at the micro scale, a little bit of plant material, a little bit of bone material, that we're gonna try and get as much information out as possible, but that's a rarity. Okay, and these in situ deposits are again also very rare for us. Um, so to that end, one of the more experimental things we're doing at the site is we're trying, we're working with the ancient DNA laboratory here at McMaster to try and extract DNA from the sediments. So you may know a bit about extracting DNA from ancient bones. This is a more recent technique where we try to pick up traces of the plants, the animals, and potentially even the humans who were here with their genetic traces in the soil itself. All right, so who do we think was coming to Slither and when do we think they were there? Just to remind you, for those who, of you who may not be very familiar with the Paleolithic, this is a very alien world to us. It's a world before uh, settled habitation. These are mobile hunter-gatherers, so we're not expecting architecture. These people are moving around the landscape seasonally. It's a, a period before the domestication of animals. All of their sustenance comes from hunting animals or the collection of wild resources. And it's an age before metal. Uh, and, and that's the importance of Stalida. Their everyday um, woodworking or, or food preparing tools or their weapons all has to be made with stone. We'll start with the most recent data. Um, we have a lot of evidence uh, of stone tools of a type we would associate with the Mesolithic. This is the period, th this is the period we associate in the Aegean with Homo sapiens. These are the latest hunter-gatherers before the introduction of farming uh, from Anatolia around 7,000 years ago. Sorry, around, yes, around 7,000 years ago. So um, the date should be around 9, um, nine to 11,000 years old, very well represented. Uh, the fact that we have Mesolithic or Naxos is no longer such a huge surprise because there have been a number of excavations, not least by Professor Adiamantos Sampson, of other island occupations uh, in the Dodecanese, in the uh, Sporades, in the Cyclades. Uh, in particular, the Cyclops Cave on Yara and the Mar uh, and Marulas on Kithnos, we have good scientific dates. Marulas is also important for us because we think it might be one of the few communities where we have a connection between uh, the stone tool use of that community with Stalida. We think that this community is coming to Naxos and getting raw materials to make their stone tools. Further back in time, but we're still dealing with Homo sapiens. We have lots and lots of evidence for upper Paleolithic tools that in theory should range between around 12 to 40,000 years uh, old based on broad understandings of this period in the Aegean. Importantly, um, we have some very distinctive tool types that one would associate with a culture or a period we refer to as the early origination. This is important because these tools we associate with the arrival of the first Homo sapiens into Europe. Uh, this material has already been documented 
in Greece at the Klezora cave and the Franci cave in the Arglid, dating back to almost 40,000 years ago. Uh, and like I said, is associated with the first modern humans to move into Europe. So the fact that we have this material on Naxos suggests that, you know, maybe they were not just walking across the Thracian land bridge, but also getting into boats uh, and coming across to continental Greece via the Cyclades. Uh, and to put this into context, Homo sapiens had already got to Australia by 60,000 years, 20,000 years earlier. So this isn't a particularly radical claim. More radically, however, is the fact that we have uh, significant quantities of middle Paleolithic tools, tools that in, in the Aegean should range in date and theory between 45 to 200,000 years old, uh, uh, the Lavalois technique, lots of cores, lots of tools, including uh, spearheads and the like, you know, classic, classic types of the middle Paleolithic. The significance being of, of these technologies, these tool types, etc., is that in Greece until recently, these tool types were exclusively associated with Neanderthals. And by extent, we have the first evidence indirectly of Neanderthals in the Cyclades, whatever the Cyclades looks like at this time, which is what I shall come back to in due course. Just to remind you, the Neanderthals are an exclusively Eurasian uh, phenomenon, uh, our closest uh, ancestor in space, time, uh, and genetically. And then perhaps more contentiously, we also have a number of uh, distinctive tools that we believe relate to the lower Paleolithic, which again in the Aegean should be at least 250,000 years old and potentially associated with the character referred to as Homo heidelbergensis, um, the likes of which again are well documented uh, on the Greek mainland, uh, but hitherto had never been found in the Cyclades. That's all well and good, but again, that argument was largely based upon things that look like X and their comparison with well-dated, well-excavated material from the mainland, both Greece uh, and to the East Turkey. Most importantly for us is our, on, our own contribution of scientific dates. We work with a laboratory in uh, Bordeaux, a uh, very well-established laboratory that does a lot of, a lot of Paleolithic uh, work in uh, Spain and in France. Uh, we've worked on a number of different uh, sondages, our uh, excavation trenches, uh, and the most complete of which was published in 2019 uh, from an almost from an over four meter deep stratigraphic sequence on the upper western flanks, our trench number one. That was published, um, like I said, in 2019, but again, not without problems. Okay, because absolutely everything in that trench was in secondary context. So all of our dates, just like Crete, we are giving a minimum date. We are basically dating with this technique, optically stimulate, stimulated luminescence dating, we are dating the last time these artifacts were exposed to the sun. Not when they were made, but when they were last rolled down the hill and then covered up. So all of the dates we're about to give you are minimum. The tools could be a little bit earlier or could be a lot earlier. Um, so ultimately, frustratingly, as it currently stands, one of our key re research questions was like, how did these pre-sapiens populations get to, get to Stelida? Did the Neanderthals come by sea? As it currently stands, it is impossible for us to answer that question. Because what we have with these maps here are dates, specific dates. This is what the Aegean looked like at this time. This is what it looked like 300,000 years ago or 480,000 years ago. All of our dates are at least X or at least Y. That's not the same thing. So you're comparing apples with oranges. So exasperatingly, we can't connect ourselves to any of these maps in particular. So we still managed to get a very high profile uh, article out of this, Science Advances um, 2019. If anybody wants to read this, email me or, or it's, it's open access. You can go and download this for free. Long story short, we have a sequence of dates that takes us back to at least 200,000 years ago. So when we started working at Stelida, the oldest occupation in the Cyclades was 11,000 years old at the site of Marulis. We have now pushed that back fairly significantly. We can prove to you that people were in Slither on Naxos over 200,000 years ago. But we don't know how they got there. So we played it kind of safe. We argued that perhaps 
it makes sense that Neanderthals or perhaps earlier characters were most able to get to Stalida in some of those colder periods. Those colder periods when the Mediterranean was much lower and you were actually able to walk across a land bridge from either mainland Greece or mainland Anatolia into the islands in a scenario like this. Now, this isn't to negate the significance of the discovery because we argued that, you know, if people are cut, if, if early humans are moving out of Anatolia into this kind of lacustrine, this wet, very different environment of this kind of what, what then becomes the Aegean, this is a very different, a radically different environment with a whole bunch of different risks of, of diseases and plants and animals than if you'd stayed on the sort of solid ground of, of the Thracian land bridge. So this in itself, the fact that people are coming there, shows their adaptive capabilities. They're more complex. They are not forced to play on the sort of the safe paths of old. It still got a whole bunch of press, it wasn't quite as sexy as Neanderthal goes to Naxos on boat, but you know, we got a whole bunch of uh, fairly complimentary coverage. Uh, and we also get to revel in the uh, delicious irony of the uh, Daily Mail celebrating a story about people coming out of the East into Europe. Um, if at that moment you had asked me, where is the most likely chance of us contributing to this evidence for pre-sapiens populations whizzing around in boats in the Aegean, I would point you to the Ionian Islands. Why? Okay, so a lot of work has been done in terms of survey, and we know, sorry, the, probably the scale's a bit small, but all those little red dots represent classic middle Paleolithic tools, Lavalois tools, Mousterian tools, etc., which up until recently, we would exclusively associate with Neanderthals. And we have a whole bunch of them on Kefalonia and Zakynthos. Importantly, another Greek paleogeographer, Ferentinos, in an article published in 2012, did a reconstruction of sea level and showed that throughout the Middle Paleolithic, Kefalonia and Zakynthos were always islands. Now, they were separated from the mainland by very short distances, but nonetheless, if these sites are indeed Middle Paleolithic, it proves indirectly that people could only have got there by boat. Now, Professor Nida Galanidou, who uh, from University of Rethimnu, who, who I mentioned beforehand, is doing excavation in this area. In theory, if she gets a scientific date, the proof of this stuff is middle Paleolithic, bingo. Nature paper, proof of Neanderthals on boats. Except it's all gone horribly wrong in a very exciting uh, and problematic way. At exactly the same time that we submitted our article to Science Advances, another article was coming out, we, we weren't cognizant of this until too late, by probably uh, the most famous Greek Paleolithic archeologist uh, and the most prolific, Katarina Harvati uh, and colleagues published an article in Nature, which is as high profile as it gets, in 2019 uh, with a restudy of a couple of uh, skulls that have been found in the Marni from a site called the uh, Apavima Cave, they had found in the 1970s. These skulls were originally thought to represent uh, uh, a Neanderthal and perhaps uh, uh, a member of uh, um, uh, Homo heidelbergensis. They went back with all sorts of new and exciting techniques, reanalyzed the skull and declared and it's been accepted by this journal, so it's been accepted by the best knowing people in the lands, that this skull, which dates to over 210,000 years ago, is Homo sapien. At this point, every head should explode. Okay, so what is the significance of this? Let's step, step back a bit. All right, Homo sapiens, we know evolved in Africa. The earliest evidence we have um, well, the evidence we currently have suggests it's a sort of a multi-regional hypothesis. We have a number of uh, um, different places in Africa. It's not a single space uh, that they emerge. Uh, but the oldest evidence we currently have for Homo sapiens populations in Africa is a site called Jebel Irud in Morocco, dating back to 300,000 years ago. Now, until the Harvati, or until around 2018, 2019, this was kind of the understanding of what happened. Homo sapiens evolves in Africa, kicks its heels for quite a long time. 
And then eventually Homo sapiens starts moving out of Africa. And initially they go across Arabia uh, and go into um, Eastern Asia, into China and Island e Asia, et cetera, and get to Australasia uh, around 60,000 years ago. And a bit later, around 55,000 years ago, they start moving into the Levant and then into Anatolia and then eventually into um, Europe, whereby in theory, we don't have Homo sapiens in somewhere like the Aegean until 40,000 years ago, whereby until recently, anything 40,000 years old in Greece, in theory, should be pre-Homo sapiens. That has all now changed. We have evidence from a site called the Mizlia cave in Israel and the Apodemia cave of much, much earlier dates of Homo sapiens. And it, so, you know, all of these maps are incredibly simplistic. It's not a single event. It's not a single movement of Homo erectus. It's not a single movement of Homo sapiens. They are moving out of these areas uh, and moving back again at different times. So what we think is happening is we have an early movement of Homo sapiens into the Aegean that ultimately fails. For, for maybe climatic reasons, it gets colder again, they move back to an area they're more comfortable with. And, and this is beautifully represented at the Apodema cave because we have Neanderthals moving into the cave 170,000 years ago. Homo sapiens lives there first, moves out, Neanderthals comes in later. All right, so what are the implications for all of this? Let's go back to Crete. Previously, the argument about pre-sapiens seafaring for Crete was based on the fact that A, Crete was an island, okay, we're fine with that, and that the only that there was no Homo sapiens around uh, 113,000 years ago, ergo, it had to be pre-Homo sapiens. Well, it doesn't have to be now, does it? In theory, if it's 113,000 years ago, it could be Homo sapiens getting on a boat and going across to Crete. And in fact, Nina Galanizu has argued in a paper that in fact, rather than the stone tools of uh, Crete from uh, Plakias looking like very early African examples, she suggests they might actually look a bit more like later African uh, Paleolithic tools dating back to around 191 to 300,000 years old, which in theory could be Homo sapiens. So yeah, if they're coming out of Africa, maybe they're Homo sapiens. Now, okay. Devil's advocate, we can put that position in, in terms of like Crete no longer has to be homo, uh, has to be pre-sapiens. The thing is, again, we shouldn't forget that the Preveli date is a minimum of 113. Who knows? Maybe it's 500,000, maybe it's a million. But certainly the Apodemia cave data muddies the water. Similarly, now, unfortunately, should Professor Galanidu go off and excavate uh, a site on Kefalonia or Zakynthos and gets a date back of 100,000 years, that's still not necessarily going to prove that these are pre-sapiens populations. Because you know what? The tools that these people are making in Morocco 300,000 years ago is also Lavalwa, the same technique we hitherto have exclusively associated with Neanderthals in Greece. What she really needs to do, and this is a very big ask, is to find Neanderthal remains which is very much a needle in a haystack. Um, they don't survive very well. Um, anyway, very, very best of luck on that front. So where does, where does this leave us then in terms of, as it all now collapse back to the only seafarers globally are Homo sapiens? Not necessarily. If we return to Flores and Southeast Asia, in Flores, we know, um, we have an excavation there, we have uh, well-recognized stone tools that have been dated to over a million years old. We also have the sea level reconstruction, and we know that this was an island at the time. So over a million years ago, uh, a population, possibly Homo erectus, managed to get to an island across open seas. And in fact, there are a few other sites, um, Sulawesi, Kalinga, over 600, over 700,000 years old. Now, the significance of all of this is that Homo sapiens hasn't evolved yet. Homo sapiens cannot be responsible for any of this. So even if we don't have a Homo erectus sitting in a boat as our archeological evidence, this has to be pre-sapiens seafaring. All right. So outside of the Aegean then, we have some solid indirect evidence the pre-sapiens crossing of, of open water. So what, where, where, where does this leave us? 
Well, well, ultimately, this then becomes another argument in terms of how much emphasis do you put on this? For some people, this is it, ta-da! It's the birth of maritime culture. We're good and going. And, and this really blurs any distinction between us uh, and them, them being our ancestors, be that Neanderthals, be that Homo erectus. Others might play it a lot safer and say, this is kind of an exception to the rule. You know, we shouldn't read too much into this. How do we gauge the significance? Cyprian Brubank, um, the Disney professor of archaeology at Cambridge, uh, wrote a very influential paper back in 2006, where without giving us the metrics that go with these terms, sketched out three different ways of perhaps thinking about moving across open water. Uh, and he gives us the term seagoing, seafaring and voyaging. Seagoing for him is essentially what we see in these pre-sapiens populations. It's not to be sniffed at, but nonetheless, you know, these are relatively small scale ventures. And so these are uh, a recent paper by um, a guy called Gaffney published this year, uh, estimates that the distances we're talking about in these um, uh, Southeast uh, Island, Southeast Asian Island uh, boat trips is maybe a, a minimum of 10 to 85 kilometers. Again, that's not to be sniffed at for, for these characters to have built a boat, to navigate it, this infers all sorts of technological uh, complexity. It might even infer language for them to be able to achieve this. And also the fact that they did it intentionally to be able to get to the island and reproduce. Because if you just get one or two people over there accidentally, then you know, they're toast within a generation. You know, they're just going to die out. However, in the grand scheme of things, if you compare this to what Homo sapiens is doing in the Paleolithic, it kind of pales into insignificance. Well, it, it, it's certainly secondary. So while we might talk about these early characters as being seagoing characters or having seagoing capabilities, Homo sapiens in the Upper Paleolithic, back to say, you know, 57,000 years ago, uh, in the case of uh, going to um, Australia, were capable of traveling over almost up to 300 kilometers with the occupation of Madagascar, New Guinea, Australasia, etc. This is a much bigger deal. And then voyaging, well, that's when, you know, tally-ho, uh, you know, westward ho, we go off to the Americas, etc. All right. So ultimately, where does this leave us? I think for a start, it shows that that sort of old, very black and white model is deeply flawed. And indeed, anything where you set up of like it's either or is always almost certainly going to be doomed to failure. There's going to be a grayness. There's going to be a muddying of the waters. So now we know that in fact Neanderthals and perhaps even some earlier characters were capable of art, burial, seafaring, etc. It, it then depends on what you do with these discoveries. And I think one of the problems I have is that there's this enormous rapprochement of like Neanderthals, there's a little bit of burial, there's a little bit of adornment, there's a little bit of uh, artwork, they're just the same as us. Actually, no. There are some significant differences, some significant uh, uh, adaptive and, and cognitive and technological distinctions between us. Um, but anyway, that's for another day. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Tristan. This is an absolutely fascinating uh, talk. Uh, thank you for, for, for um, showing all of this um, to us. Um, I want to ask our many friends here who are with us um, this evening, if you um, have any questions for Tristan, just um, um, write them down in the, um, in the, the uh, conversation window there. And um, Stringy, we will um, um, get uh, to those and, and, and be able to answer uh, as many, you know, as you, as you wish. I wanted to um, ask you, Tristan, I didn't get exactly the, the period during which this Stelida uh, area is worked. How, how, how long are, are people visiting this, this site? Um, I think the safest answer at the moment would be to say that the site was probably intermittently used from at least 200,000 years ago. So if, if we play things very safely, we would suggest that um, maybe uh, the pre-sapiens populations are only getting there in the very cold periods. So in the, in the very cold periods, 
Um, Greece is probably seen as quite uh, an attractive place because it's not as cold as sort of central northern Europe. Um, and maybe as, as populations, Neanderthals and perhaps earlier populations are coming down into places like the Marni, um, they are also moving across these newly exposed land bridges to places like Naxos. And then maybe as things warm up, uh, those land bridges are lost uh, and we have a gap of a few thousand years or perhaps even tens of thousands of years um, until it gets cold again, until we get to the upper Paleolithic, uh, at which point we are happy that maybe Homo sapiens are capable of making boats and going there across water, which does raise the interesting question of, is uh, Stelida rediscovered time and time again, or is there some kind of deep time folk memory that allows people who can't even get there to remember that it's there? You know, um, so, uh, you know, we do have a few in situ sensu latu uh, um, uh, um, deposits. And I think the, the next stage is to really target those deposits to try and get dates. The other thing we have a, a, a new uh, PhD student, uh, Nino Tafin from um, uh, Bordeaux, who is working on a new version of the dating technique that doesn't date when the stone tools were covered, but when the stone tools were made. And if we can date that, then we'll have a much better idea of exactly when people were there. Thank you. Thank you a lot. OK, I'm going to go through the, um, uh, um, the list here. Lucia, Lucia Nixon, who I'm sure you know. Hi, Lucia. Uh, she has a, a question. What is the latest on the material from Gavdos and Lutro? Um, I'm not sure if anything further has been published, I think there was more, uh, so the original Gavdos publication was in Antiquity Gallery, um, which was very well read, but as you know, uh, it wasn't peer reviewed at that time. I think uh, um, uh, the Gavdos team, Professor Kopka, uh, has published more material in um, the Cretological, but I think unfortunately, you know, I mean, th there is a, a very rich history and a very highly regarded history of survey archaeology in the Aegean by Greeks and foreign schools alike. Um, but I really feel, and, and there is a slight irony in all of this, that the king of survey himself, John Cherry, who, who's you know, never dedicated his time to excavation, survey can answer everything. He's the one who basically says, you need to dig this stuff. You need to dig it and you need to date it. Um, so I, I, I don't have a problem with the Lutro material, the Gavdos material being middle Paleolithic, um, except as I've just explained, um, Lavalois, technology, which is what they have on Gavdos, um, is no longer potentially exclusively associated with, Homer, with um, Neanderthals. So we, we desperately need to excavate to answer these questions. Um, so, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time doing survey. Uh, I'm an advocate of survey, but for, for these periods, we have to dig and we have to date. Thanks. Joseph uh, Harris here has a question. If there are such similarities between these species, why were Homo sapiens uniquely capable to adapt to different environments and outcompete them? Um, I, I think, you know, devil is in the detail here. Um, the recent discoveries of artwork, adornment, possibly seafaring, etc., has brought the Neanderthal closer to us. But I think there's a real danger in then making them completely analogous. Um, it still remains that, for example, uh, Homo sapiens, when they first, so, so one of the arguments about the dying out of Neanderthals in, in Europe, for example, is about, it's a harsh environment. Um, there's not much good hunting meat out there. And the Neanderthals, we believe their diet is heavily biased towards meat eating. Homo sapiens has a much broader based diet. So if you both have a, a lousy day hunting, Homo sapiens goes home and eats all sorts of other things. Neanderthals have rumbling tummies. Um, so, so there, there is a, a better adaptation in terms of your food um, strategy there. Also, Homo sapiens has a better hunting technique. They have spear throwers, which makes um, longer targeted this, uh, hunting better, um, uh, less dangerous. Um, also Neanderthals, you know, Neanderthals are up against big beasties who can stamp them with feet or you know, poke them with long teeth and et cetera. Uh, and then also there's this, you know, part of the argument is demographic. 
is that basically the Neanderthals uh, interbred, but ultimately were overwhelmed uh, um, by the breed. You know, there was basically more Homo sapiens. The evidence we currently have from Siberia and Iberia suggests you know, the last groups of Neanderthals are very small, uh, evidence for uh, inbreeding, which again is going to be uh, um, detrimental to their genetic and physical health. So, you know, there are still some differences between us um, and that and our demographic capabilities, et cetera, you know, uh, ends up being this winning strategy. Right. And again, none of this is, is kind of a perfect storm. Any any time, like last week, there was this paper on, you know, the, 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 the magnetic poles flipped 42,000 years ago, and that killed off the Neanderthals. Anybody who ever gives you a, a single answer in terms of like the collapse of Minoan civilization or, or the, the death of the Neanderthals, it was Thera, it was whatever, just laugh at them. It's not that simple. It's gonna be a perfect storm of a whole bunch of different things. But thanks, thanks. Um, Susan is wondering if in the DNA testing of soil at Celida there was any trace of Neanderthal DNA. Um, I have to find a few more thousand dollars before I can answer that question. <laughs> um, it's, it's quite an expensive technique. We've run the first suite of analyses, so now we have to um, run it again, specifically targeting uh, for Neanderthal and Homo sapiens traces. Um, it's a tricky technique. It's, it's a new technique. Um, the first couple of papers when they were published, um, one was on uh, the Denisovan cave in Atapuerca and other places, and another paper was on the Kezem cave in Israel. And unfortunately, it seems to be a situation where, where you have fabulous preservation of organics, faunal remains, hominin remains, et cetera, places like Adapuerka and Denisova, you get fabulous uh, ancient DNA in the sediments. And then places like the Kezem cave in Israel, where you have almost no organic preservation, you get very little sedimentary DNA. And unfortunately, that at the moment seems to be the case with Stelida, but very poor survival. Okay, good. Uh, Anestis Tiris now is wondering if there are any uh, Paleolithic data for the Sporades and uh, if there is any linkage with the, with the, Cyclad, uh, with the Cycladic Islands. Um, Sporades, um, the earliest evidence I know from Sporades uh, is Mesolithic, and it was certainly an island at that point, which is uh, on uh, Yaura, uh, excavations well published by Professor Adam Aviamanto Sampson. Um, the islands, uh, please email me, I can send you the information. Uh, Professor Avia Mantel Sampson has also published um, from the Northern Aegean Islands. I can't remember whether it's the Northern Aegean, I can't remember which island it is, um, but certainly there other, are other islands where material has been found that is again Lavalois, should be Middle Paleolithic. Uh, we don't have dates yet, I think, from this material. Um, so there is tantalizing evidence out there. I should also point out that, you know, there's, there's been a real research bias. Um, 15 years ago, if you'd asked for a grant to go and look for Paleolithic archeology span in the Sporades or in the Cyclades or whatever, you probably wouldn't have got it because the received wisdom was, it's not out there. So I think now with the work on Crete, the work on Naxos, the work in the Ionian Islands, it's gonna make it a lot easier for scholars to get research money to actually go out and look for this stuff. And I think it's gonna be there, but then, it's a matter of like tying in, A, getting the dates and tying in whether that landscape today that is an island was actually an island at the time of the Paralympic. Good. Okay, we have a few, a few last ones, two, three more questions for you, um, uh, Tristan. One from a, a colleague or a student of yours, I guess, at McMaster. Um, this question is, so with, with these new dates that may be developed with these newer updated techniques, does this present new opportunities to match the dates with sea levels at various points? Yes, if, if, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and you know, that, that's what we're searching for now is, you know, either, you know, it's going to be a dual effort. A, uh, trying to find uh, in-situ deposits, which could be a bit of a needle in a haystack job, or if we can date when the tool was made, and then we can re relate it to the work of the Greek paleogeographers, then we can say, aha, if they were here, you know, 120,000 years ago, it had to be water. Mm -hmm. um, of course, then proving it was a Neanderthal is another thing. So <laughs> thanks, to, thanks to Professor Havarti, things have got a lot more complex, but that's, that's the fun. Okay, uh, two last ones. 
So one from uh, Dionysios uh, Danelatos. Thank you very much for your amazing presentation. You mentioned about significant differences between sapiens and Neanderthals. And of course, it is a whole conversation. But is it possible, briefly, to say something about different cognitive differences in tools? Does the finding of the string traces in Abri du Maras in France play any role in the seafaring theories? Um, uh, the first part, if you look at it, you know, the, the earlier Homo sapiens stone tool making traditions, it is not really that different from Neanderthals. There isn't a suggestion. I mean, this is the really one of the, the fascinating things, uh, the so-called sapient paradox. It's not a matter of like Homo sapiens appears, evolves and like bingo, we're, we're, we're you know, number one. It takes us a little while. And there's a big argument as to what sort of sets us off. Is it, um, you know, genetic drift or is it, you know, what's the catalyst that makes us really special? So, you know, a lot, a lot of, um, there's a lot of respect for Neanderthal tool technology. The Lavalois technique involves an enormous amount of, of planning and forethought. It's a multi-stage uh, napping process with lots of opportunities, things for going wrong. Uh, you know, to teach it to somebody else is going to take a lot of complexity. And, and that technique is, is essentially what earlier Homo sapiens has. Where we get excited about Homo sapiens tool technology is actually a lot later. So it's after about 30,000 30, years ago um, when they start making uh, these long stone tools, blades, which then becomes sort of the Swiss army knife of the Paleolithic. You can make a blade uh, and make it pointy and make it into a spear, or you can make it a scraper, etc. But that's after the Neanderthals have gone. So again, we have to be very careful in terms of, you can't just say, oh, uh, um, Homo sapiens stone tools were much more advanced than Neanderthals. You have to compare the same period. And when you compare the same period, they're actually not dissimilar. And, and like I said, which I think relates to the, the next question, um, the, the technology, uh, the stone tools being produced by the early Homo sapiens in North Africa is to all intents and purposes, the same as that being made by the Neanderthals. Um, the use of string, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's been various, I mean, we, we, you know, lots of these little discoveries just keep inching up our respect for the Neanderthals. We have evidence for their spearheads being hafted using uh, birch glue. So their ability to extract a raw material from wood and, and heat it up and make an early glue, you know, that, that again, complexity we previously did not uh, accord them. The use of string for much the same uh, reasons. Certainly, I would imagine that the ability to make uh, a binding agent like a string or a rope is gonna be pretty fundamental to making a sea craft. So your point is very well made. Um, of course, um, how old that is, we don't know because organics, again, it's only under very rare conditions that you're gonna get things like string and other organics surviving, but yeah. Good, okay. So our last question is from Laura Gagné. Uh, you said something about the Homo sapiens in Northwestern Africa using Levallois tools that can be associated with Neanderthals. How can you tell whether the tools are Neanderthal rather than Homo sapiens? Excellent question. A uh, very important question and probably a very difficult one for me to ask. I remember years ago talking to Steve Kuhn, a very well-respected Paleolithic archaeologist, before we sort of started Salida, um, about, you know, can you directly associate, you know, stone tools for the Paleolithic are pretty much it in terms of our evidential basis. And so we try to extract as much information out of them as possible. We use stone tools to date sites. You know, this type looks like this date, this type looks like that date. And there has been an attempt to associate particular kinds of stone tools with different kinds of species. These stone tools equals Neanderthals. These stone tools equals Homo sapiens. Um, I don't know enough about the intricacies of the Lavalois technique to know whether or not there are certain aspects of Lavalois technology that are exclusively associated with Homo sapiens and others which are exclusively associated with Neanderthals. Um, and even if we did have that pattern at the moment, one has to wonder how robust it is. We have hundreds, thousands of sites um, in Europe, in North Africa, and throughout 
uh, Eurasia, um, you know, in, in to, through the Levant and uh, up into the Caucasus, where we have Lavalois tools, but we have very, very few sites with early Homo sapiens physical remains or early or Neanderthal physical remains. So, you know, we might have a, an early pattern of like these three sites with Homo sapiens skeletons, the Lavalois looks a bit like this, and those three sites with Lavalois uh, and Neanderthals look a bit like that. But, you know, there's hundreds more sites where we don't have them. So, you know, maybe one day we can, you know, get something out of it. I mean, because ho hoping for um, skeletons is, is pie in the sky. So maybe things like the sedimentary DNA or, or other techniques are going to be able to um, figure this out for us. But I mean, that, that's a hugely important question and certainly has completely muddied the waters. You know, like I said, the, the logic until Havati's paper was in Greece, uh, the Lavalwa technology was exclusively associated with Neanderthal remains. That's two or three sites. So go figure. Once again, Tristan, thank you very, very much. Fantastic talk, extremely interesting. Thank you all for um, being with us uh, this afternoon, this evening, uh, this morning, uh, and we hope to see you soon on our, uh, for our other um, lectures.